over there was always light if only we're brave enough to see it. The poet versus a parent's challenge. Our students' education is being weaponized right now. The new school laws, the fears, and the facts. And it is going to reform these problematic practices. New rights for doctors and insurers. Racist, sexist, anti-gay. Bring new concerns of medical discrimination. We chose facts over fear when it wasn't popular. We chose education over indoctrination. The Gov is finally official. <laughs> on the campaign trail. What happens now? Make no mistake, he is still governor, but I'm going to continue to do whatever I need to do and step up in areas that, that I'm asked to step up in. And how does it all land with South Florida's youngest voters? The big news of the week from all angles on this Memorial Day edition of This Week in South Florida. Good Sunday morning. I'm Glenna Milberg. What a better way to mark Memorial Day than focused on our freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of and from religion, etc., and how those rights are being debated in real time right here. Case in point, this week in South Florida, the news that one Miami-Dade parent had requested to have removed from her children's school library this. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We the reaction on social media of inaugural poet laureate Amanda Gorman, who considered her poem, she called it banned and then used that word, brought nationwide attention to Miami-Dade schools and a rare public reaction from the school district clarifying that it was not banned. Florida's new expanded rights and education law and the law called individual freedoms that puts parameters on how history is taught has become one of the most politically charged changes in Florida education. Miami-Dade School Board member Robert Alonzo is live with us today. School Board is a nonpartisan entity currently and we like to look at things here from a partisan free lens and so it is great to have you Roberto aboard for the program today. Thank you so much for having me this morning, Glenn. Always a pleasure. So let's talk a little broad as we go on. But right now, I want to start with this specific news of the week and the fact that Miami-Dade responded to a challenge by a parent for this specific poem, this specific book, by actually moving it from elementary school to middle school. And it was an age-appropriate issue that was looked at. So fill in the details there for me a little bit. Definitely, yes, uh, Glenna. So we have a policy that was actually put in place back in May of 2011, where all parents have the ability to put in concerns regarding any material used within our schools. This particular parent had a concern about five books that were inside of our media center, and that went over to this committee, which is actually called the Schools Material Review Committee to review, and they deemed that the books were not inappropriate and they were actually kept inside of our media centers. So the, uh, the policy that you mentioned is pretty comprehensive. It's 18 pages long. It was written in 2011, but then it was revised um, every couple of years at first. And then I noticed revisions every year since 2021. Um, I'm guessing to comport with new Florida laws that have come down the pike since then. So, so let's look at the very specific challenges because they are public record, anybody can see them. And, and I wanna go through them by putting them up first, uh, so on a graphic so people can see it. The first one is the hill we climb. So this, okay, let's, let's do then another one since we're looking at Love to Langston is the name of the book. This is kind of a poetry um, biography of poet Langston Hughes. And this was challenged by the same person uh, and now we're looking at the, the two different things. Let's go back to, yeah, let's go back to love for Langston. Okay, Roberto, I don't know if you can see what we're seeing, but we're seeing the actual um, petition. And there are questions on the petition, and I want to direct some people to look at, number one, it, the question is, to what do you object? And that is left blank on one of them. And here, on this one, it says, 
The objection is the page starts with CRT, critical race theory is CRT, and more pages that have the same. And then a number seven is what do you believe the, is the function of the material? And the petitioner said indoctrination. And so I want to, let's start there, if you would. What do you make of this kind of petition with those specific objections? And oh, by the way, the, the parent admits that she has not actually seen professional reviews on the material. So, so let's start there. What do you make of this kind of petition using the words CRT and indoctrination, which frankly really wasn't part of the common lexicon before it became sort of partisan buzzwords in the past couple of sessions? Yeah, so Ben, I can't speak for the particular parent. Um, every parent has the right to submit their complaints with their views. Um, what I can assure the public is that there was nothing of indoctrination or CRT in any of these five textbooks um, that this parent had brought up. And it was reviewed by a, a committee of professionals um, that came back and provided their feedback on it um, and deemed it to be appropriate inside of our school libraries and media centers. So on the hill we climb, and if we can put up that um, petition, the graphic of that petition again. On the hill we climb, it's the same parent um, who had also very similar objections, also did not fill out the first actual question, which is, why do you object to this material? There was just no answer to that. And then um, one of the questions is, if we can see it again, that would be amazing. Are you aware of the professional reviews on this material? And the parent said on this question, she answered, I don't need it. She didn't need the professional reviews. Uh, number seven is, what do you believe is the function of this material? And the parent wrote, cause confusion and indoctrinate students. So while it is uh, this woman and every single parent's right to object to anything, when you see these kind of objections, and then ultimately it goes through the process, are, are, you, are you concerned that this is being politicized? I'm concerned that the entire process has been politicized, Gana. Um, even as we look in the media, that the continued narrative is that books have been banned. No books have been banned um, from our libraries. All these books are available. And, you know, I think parents are confused. And, you know, we need to be respectful to have a good dialogue amongst all of ourselves um, with people who think differently. And this individual might think differently. And what we do is we always assure our parents that everything's going to be reviewed by a prof professionals. And in this case, it was reviewed by professionals. And no one parent will ever have the ability to just remove a book from a school. And no books have been banned in Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Right. And that, that's been actually in the political rhetoric. That's been very damaging to have the word banned where a ban does not exist. There have been removals, no doubt. And, and there is a great debate over what's appropriate and what is not. So take us through how subjective or objective is the determination of what is appropriate, age appropriate, and what is not. So in this case, what was found was um, the committee of, uh, I think it was about seven members. Um, this was composed of teachers, media specialists, school counselors, as well as district administrators that review the content of the books. Um, this book in particular, if we look back at the book of um, the hill we climb um, is actually listed, and we sent this message out to our parents um, inside of Tidal Wave by Follett, who's actually the publisher, to be characterized as a middle school grades book. And it's also like characterized the same way an accelerated reader. So that is why the, uh, the team that was uh, set to review this book in the committee decided that the book should be placed in that area very similar to when we go to Barnes & Noble or any of the local bookstores where books are put in categories. That's the, the only thing that was determined by this group. Um, there was no removal of that book suggested in any way. And is there a component on this book or any book, is, it, is there a component for other parents who may have very different views to object to having a book removed or moved and ask that it be reinstated? Well, absolutely. Any parent can bring back another concern. Um, in this case, the local PTA has sent letters of support for the entire process um, and have actually come forward and saying that they themselves have asked their children if they have the ability to go see the book. And all students in the book have the ability, even the students that are in elementary grade levels. Um, so it's not that the book is now only available to middle school students. This is a K through eight school, meaning that um, we have a mix of students there. But if a student is able to read at that level, 
um, they have the access to be able to gain access to these books and the teachers as well as the media specialists always assist them with having access to all the books inside of our media centers. All right, I want to take this a little bit broader. We have to take a quick break, sit tight for a few minutes, and we will be right back with Miami-Dade School Board member Roberto Alonzo next. back with Miami-Dade School Board member Roberto Alonzo talking about the whole process of reviewing books and parent challenges that have become so much part of the political narrative, not only in Florida, but nationwide in the past year. Um, Roberto, have you seen an uptick in these kind of challenges? Actually, Glenna, no. This is the first challenge that we received, um, and it was reviewed through our committees. Um, but no, it's, there has not been an uptick on this. And the, the parent challenges are very different from the actual process that the school boards use, not only Miami-Dade, but all, use to vet textbooks originally before they go into classrooms, before they go into libraries. That, is that right? That is correct. Yes. Yeah, so um, this was an actual localized review. When a parent comes in with a complaint, it's dealt locally at the school level. Um, with the principal, and that's what our board policy instructs. Um, when we're looking at overall curriculum, yes, it starts off at the state where the Department of Education will review it, and then it's given to the school board where we then have the guidelines on the books and which will be used within our schools. So in the past two legislative sessions, the education, some of the education laws, because there's been a lot, have, um, that have addressed guardrails and guidelines for certain types of education really revolve around sex education, uh, education as related to gender and gender, I gender identity, and also history, particularly how to teach the history of race in America. And those are now codified in law in Florida for uh, just the past two sessions. How, you know, we've talked about that on this program and, and on the news so much, and there is a perception and there is fact. And I wonder if you would go over, because you've seen a lot of that sitting on the dais of the Miami-Dade County School Board, Take us through how you deal with the perception that some of these lessons are going to either, um, the words I've heard are erase or ignore or discriminate against people in public school who may be affected. Well, Glenna, as you know, we're probably one of the most diverse communities in this country. Um, in Miami-Dade County, we serve you know hundreds of different nationalities and languages um, and no history is being erased. We are still teaching history um, within us, inside of all of our schools. Um, and it's never been erased. And it's something that we're not going to erase. We're all very proud of our heritage. And it's something that, as a school board, that is very diverse right now at this point moment as well. Um, we represent all the different communities within here. And we're going to continue to always represent them and teach the history that's, uh, that's behind it. There is, in Florida state law and also in the school districts, there are mandates to teach history. There is African-American history, Holocaust history. Um, but the way that's taught and the specific acronym CRT, which, which this parent who used on the petition forms used that acronym, what is in the definition of the school board, how do you define CRT, which actually is a college level theory course, how do you define that in Miami-Dade schools and, and where do you see that For, as an example? I know that's kind of a big broad question, but as an example, Help us understand when a parent challenges a book on CRT, what does that mean to the district and what would that look like? So Glenna, to start off with, there is no CRT within our school system. Like you said, that's been something that's been in higher education and more of a discussion there. Um, I can assure parents that um, the history we're teaching is the accurate history of what has occurred in American history, um, as well as world history. Um, so a lot of the times what we look at is the educational value and the historical significance that the, the content has. Um, we never go into any of those divisive languages or issues. Um, and for anybody who watches our meetings, they'll, they'll watch that the majority of our board meetings are really focused on the children and not following what's going on in the local media or nationwide politics. You know what I learned from that 18 pages of policy on looking at books? Uh, I don't think I knew, and maybe a lot of people don't, that challenges come from not only parents, but legitimate challenges are taken from a resident of Miami-Dade County. I'm not quite sure if Broward might have that same rule. I guess I'm presuming that, that it probably does. But why would a resident of Miami-Dade County with no child in school, public school or private school, 
why would that person be given jurisdiction to challenge what is in schools? Well, Glenn, I think that's that, that proof of the transparency of the district. Um, the district is here to serve our entire community as a whole. And even though you might not have a child inside of our school system, you still are a tax paying resident in Miami-Dade County. And your voice is always heard within our district. So our district is representative of our entire community. Um, and we're always gonna listen. But once again, it's always gonna go back to the professionals and policies have been in place so that the professionals will be the ones making the final determination on what it is that is being reported and if something could be changed in our schools. Um, not, not, no one single voice will ever have the ability to remove or challenge anything within our district. It'll always be reviewed by the professionals. How do you think this became so partisan? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think uh, we've always had partisan issues throughout our country. If you look back in history, um, it's what really makes us as diverse as we are. Many of us who have come to this country, my parents, for example, came from a country in which they did not have a voice. This country allows everybody to have a voice, to be able to share their opinions, and to go into a, a good, respectful dialogue. And I think that's what we have to continue to do and what we have to show our children. Because at the end of the day, our children are watching us every day. And we have to be able to have constructive dialogue that is respectful of everybody's opinion, even though we might not agree with each other at points. We are all about respectful dialogue here. Roberto Alonso, great to see you. Have a beautiful Memorial Day, and we certainly do appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Up next, a new state law that gives doctors an opt-out to health care they might object to. What does that mean, and what about the patients? That's next. <music> In an avalanche of bills the governor is signing into law, one is called Protections of Medical Conscience. And when it takes effect in July, it will give doctors the right to opt out of any health care services that he or she might object to for moral or religious reasons. And it would give that same right to insurance companies that will be able to opt out of paying for services on that same basis. The concerns came quick and loud from opponents worried about whose health care might suffer. Right there, State Rep. Brandy Fine is one of the proponents of this bill here to help us examine it. It is so nice to see you. The last we saw each other was in Jerusalem last month. That's right. It was a great, great couple of days. Yes, and that was about signing the anti-Semitism bill, which was a very big deal. This bill, though, is uh, kind of more under the radar. That's why I'm, I'm so happy that you're here to sort of parse out what all of this means. And I looked up conscious-based objection in medicine. It is not a new term. In fact, the literature is decades old. There is even some laws in other states on the books. So take us through why, why here, why now? Well, why now is what happened during COVID. We had a doctor who's actually now in the legislature who was threatened to have his board certification taken away because he wasn't willing to tell his patients that they should always wear masks, particularly after the science came out that showed they weren't all that effective. We believe that the right of free speech is sacrament. And, and so doctors should be protected for that just like anybody else. And no one should be punished for having their own opinion. This bill, the bill is about, and what it actually says, is the bill to prevent doctors and medical professionals from being discriminated against. That, that is in the bill if they're guided by a moral or religious objections. So that brings up the unintended consequences because in this state that's so diverse with so many different perspectives, one person's moral or religious objection may well infringe in perception or reality on another's rights. What do you foresee as an, any, uh, do you foresee unintended consequences here? I don't, because you have to keep in mind anyone who has a moral or religious objection to providing a service inherently does not believe that service is health care because no doctor would refuse to provide something that they actually believe is health care. But for example, if you're a doctor that does not believe in abortion, no one should be able to compel you to do it. That person fundamentally believes that an abortion is murder and no one should be making them provide that. There are enough doctors in this state, there are enough medical professionals in this state that people should be able to find the healthcare practices they need. And by the way, if they can't, that probably says there's something wrong with what it is that they're trying to get done. You know, Rep. Fine, I, I'm thinking about one of the committee meetings where one of your colleagues, um, had looked at a committee audience full of people who were advocating for LGBT and transgender health care and rights 
and, and literally said to them that they were the Antichrist, that they, you know, I, I, can't, I don't want to quote him or put words in his mouth, but, and he was very direct and very unvarnished, and, um, and it was a little hard to listen to someone being talked to as a human being by that way, but I, I think the health care of the LGBTQ and transgender community, which the people who are in that position feel like they are in the crosshairs because there are people, to your point, who just don't believe in them or what their needs are. How do you foresee that happening in this state, the fairness well, I'd, of that health care? Sure. I'd first reject the premise of the question. There's no special, quote unquote, health care that a gay or lesbian person needs. And it's very unfortunate the gay and lesbian community, that they have been lumped in with a group of people that actually do require medical treatments in order to try to change who they are. I think it's very discriminatory towards gays and lesbians, and I think we need to take a strong stand against it. But as it relates to transgender folks, if there are doctors who believe that providing castrating drugs to an individual or cutting off perfectly healthy body parts violates their religious beliefs, no one should be forced to do that. And the fact of the matter is, if people can't find doctors willing to cut off perfectly healthy body parts, then maybe they should be thinking about whether that's a good idea or not. Is there any comparison there at all to circumcision, which is a Jewish ritual? Um, no, there's not, but because that is something that actually has documented health benefits. The vast majority of people in this country that are circumcised are not Jewish. I believe there's about 40 circumcised individuals for, that are not Jewish for every one that is. So clearly they're not doing it because of their religious beliefs. But that said, this bill would say to a doctor, if you do not believe in circumcision because of a moral or a religious belief, I'm not sure about any religion that believes that, but you certainly could do that. But like I said, 90% plus of people who are circumcised, it has to do with medical reasons. It's got nothing to do with their religion. So in reading the bill, it sounds like, or it looks like, there is a provision for emergency care. It appears the way I read it, and, and help me through this, it appears that if there is an instance where emergency care is needed, which usually is life or death, um, for someone who has a, a problem that might be a religious or moral issue to a doctor, that that all bets are off, that, that the Hippocratic Oath has to take over. Am I reading that properly? You are. And I think this is very rare where someone would be asked to do something to save someone's life that violates their, their moral or religious beliefs. But just to be clear, we've made it clear that a doctor can't stand by at the side of the road and allow someone to die because of some moral or religious belief. But I think that happens in, in an extraordinarily rare circumstances. There was a Supreme Court decision, uh, Supreme Court of the United States decision about 10 years ago, a little less than 10 years ago. I, I just want to call it the Hobby Lobby opinion. And frankly, I, I haven't looked it up, so I don't know who the, who the proponent was. But um, it allows companies generally to, the Supreme Court says, companies may opt out of providing health insurance for employees when it is paying for something that is morally or religiously objectionable, like con like contraception in the case of Hobby Lobby. Do you draw parallels here? Well, I think private, I, I generally believe the government should stay out of private relationships between employers and employees. If you don't like the terms by which your employer hires you, then you don't have to work for them. And I think the, the vice versa is true. So I, look, if the folks at Hobby Lobby believe that contraception violates their religious views, and there are some people that believe that, they should not be forced to pay for it. And for those people who it's very important to, they are not forced to go and work there. I would also note though, that contraception in this country is not very expensive. And so I don't know that that's much of an issue. All right, well, you know, we can't count people's money, but um, can, I, can I switch gears a little sure. bit for you? So you're up for a job at Florida Atlantic University. Tell us about it. Well, I was approached by the governor back in February um, who asked me to consider doing it. And I said, if, they, if I'm someone that they're interested in having, um, um, that I'm interested in doing it, but they're going through a process to figure out who they want and, and we'll see what happens. As president. Um, yeah, as president of the university, yes, yeah. ma'am. Um, so the the university, uh, your background is not in education, but you have a board seat in education, right? You have um, you were sitting on committees. Um, I've chaired um, both committees that set budgets for education in Florida, both the K through 12 appropriations budget as well as the higher education budget. 
Um, and so as a result, I have a very deep understanding for how education is funded. And I've been involved in a lot of the in a lot of the educational policies in the state. But in many of our universities now, we're seeing whether it was John Thrasher at Florida State or Richard Corcoran at New College, the notion of someone from the outside coming in is not a novel concept here in Florida. No, and in fact, not a novel concept elsewhere, too, because in administration, you need all kinds of skills and tools to, to run any business or any corporation or any university. Um, I want to just take that in real quickly, get your take on the direction. Many people are watching the direction of education become much more conservative, including higher education. And there are opponents who said, especially what I guess the tip of the spear is new college and the vast changes in, in what was a liberal college now becoming very conservative. And I wonder if you would answer opponents who say that Florida's higher education will be subject to people who might not want to come to Florida from elsewhere to participate in higher education because of what's going on. Well, fun fact, um, our universities have to prioritize Floridians. In fact, we have a 90% rule that 90% of the students have to come to Florida. So that's kind of a, a nonsense argument that people throw out. But what I would say is this. I don't think that our universities are becoming conservative. I think what they are becoming is balanced. Universities, I experienced it 30 years ago when I was in college, are generally far left, very liberal institutions that only support one, one type of thinking. In Florida, we're not trying to make them conservative. We're trying to make them balanced. Now, I know if you're on the woke left, that seems like it's conservative because you're used to having unvarnished ability to do what you want. But in Florida, we're trying to make things in the center where whether you're conservative or liberal, there's a place for you to go to school. And that's something that may make Florida unique to the rest of the country that isn't interested in a balanced educational approach. We will be watching how that happens for sure. And we always love to have you on this program. I hope you'll be back soon. Thanks so much, Representative Randy Fine, Brevard County. Happy to do it anytime. Thanks. And next, we take it to a little next gen roundtable and the perspectives of South Florida's youngest voters. For at least 48 hours this week, South Florida was the center of the presidential universe as governor and now candidate for president chose Miami as his day one base of fundraising operations. That is, after making the announcement in Twitter cyberspace that made headlines for a variety of reasons. And that is what starts out our roundtable today. And if you are a regular here, you know we work very hard to give voice to diverse perspectives, right? And the youngest voters who could be coming to the 2024 campaign trail really in, in record numbers. We'll see. And uh, we want to be seen and heard by the candidates. Jaden D'Onofrio is chair of the Florida Democratic Youth Council. Kevin Cooper is vice chair of the Republican Party of Miami-Dade. That was pretty meteoric rise Thank for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome. It's so great to have you. They just met today. Why are you so much taller than I am? <laughs> <laughs> they just met. And, um, and I want to really get into like a lot of the news of the week and, and get your perspectives because younger voters don't really ever get to do that very much. So um, Jaden, you were chosen for the first question. A lot of finger pointing from yeah. this direction. I want to no, I really want to talk about the Twitter launch because that was kind of a it was a first of its kind, a kind of a novel idea, way glitchy. And that's kind of what made the headlines. Um, give me your perspective. Good idea, bad idea? Because Twitter is not really a 20-something social media very much. Right. Yeah, well, Glenna, yeah. thank you for having us on, first off. Of course. Um, that whole launch by Governor DeSantis for president was absolutely insane, in my opinion. Is that, wait, is it insane? I use I, insane it, as a good thing sometimes. <laughs> no, is that for me, I don't generally use it in that way. Okay. For, because I, we have never really seen an announcement in that form, and we saw... I mean, if I was a voter for the Republican Party, would I ever want to vote for someone that can't even launch a, a good well, campaign? Well, let's see. <laughs> let's 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 look at. Uh, there's your question. It just shows you how much excitement there is on the Republican side. You know, Trump rallies are standing room only. DeSantis literally melted down the internet with his announcement. Our events at the Republican Party, they sell out in one day. We literally don't have venues large enough to fit our audiences. And so people are motivated. We're getting dozens, hundreds of calls every week. We want to be involved. We want to get involved in this race. We want to rescue our country. And so people Wait, are coming to us. Wait, take me back to Twitter. Wait, go back. Take me sure. back to Twitter. For, because that, that was a really interesting thing you just brought up that I hadn't really thought of is the crowd size. Remember when right? President Trump was elected, that whole nonsense about how big the crowd was at the inaugural. So 
It, there really was 700,000 people waiting in the room before it crashed, and Elon Musk had to turn it over to another, uh, another venue of his narrator, so there weren't that many people. But, but do you think, ooh, let me ask you, do you think that the governor chose not to do it in public because of the numbers? I'm not sure. I mean, that's for him to answer, right? But I, I think on the whole, though, you see there is a level of motivation. There's a level of excitement. There's a level of enthusiasm that's unmatched on the Democrat side. I mean, people literally are, are begging to be involved in the 2024 election. And so doing it online was actually very smart because it opened up the venue to people. It opened up the ability for people to both listen, participate, and be involved in Twitter. And now Twitter really, with, with President Trump, it started, right? It is a commonplace, a marketplace of ideas where you can discuss things. And that's what the Republican Party is, is focused on in this primary. It's creating a sharing of ideas, of really looking forward to the future, of putting our policies out there and having a spirited debate on that. You know, they, the, they talked a, a lot about that on the Twitter feed, that there was this, this is a First Amendment space and a is. sharing of ideas, but that, as we know, has a giant double-edged sword downside and the effect and misinformation and disinformation that you really have to be a critical news consumer. Um, Kevin said something about um, the, the actual engagement of the local Republican Party is that matched by the local Democratic Party? And, and I ask you that knowing that there are Democrats in high places who say, we didn't turn out in this last election. Where were Democrats? What do you, what, what's happening there on that account? Well, I think a lot of us envision uh, midterm elections uh, to be almost a sort of a referendum for our incumbent presidents. And we saw overwhelmingly across the nation that uh, President Biden is very popular amongst Democrats and even Republicans. Um, it was a history-altering election uh, for the midterms. We had a problem here in Florida. We know that there's problems here in Florida. Um, and we look forward to transitioning towards a Florida Democratic Party that's going to engage all of our voters well, when you um, say, across the ballot. When you say problems here in Florida, detail that for us. Well, I think right now we're on the front lines in so many different ways. Our voters are on the front lines in so many different ways. We've been attacked by Governor DeSantis. Um, we see our LGBTQ plus community be constantly attacked by various types of bills. We just saw a new bill that allows Governor DeSantis to run for president with SB 7050. Um, and there's multiple lawsuits for that bill um, because of the issues in um, how it's going to limit the youth vote, limit the minority vote. Um, so with these attacks that we have in our communities, we're trying to defend on so many different sectors of our state. So let me, let me just kind of un unpack that because that huge election bill is being challenged, but to my knowledge, it's not challenged on the resign to run law, which was taken out, reversed, to allow the governor to run and not have to resign when he runs for president, which actually was the same years ago in Florida and then was changed, resigned to run. So, so that's a, whole, a little part of that big election bill. And you know what I think the funniest part of it is, is that Governor DeSantis actually supported that bill originally, and now he's the one taking it out to go and make himself run for president. And, and may I say, a lot of the lawmakers who voted for it agree with him. But that, that's... Um, you know, you just heard, you met today, you told me you like each other, which I love. I love, I love spreading love. Um, so you just heard Jaden talk about how the LGBT community is, is being attacked. What, what's your perspective on that? I focus on the state as a whole, right? And a rising tide lifts all ships. And so, you know, while the Democrats are looking to divide us and to say, you know, this, this group and that group is being, is being attacked, I, I don't see it that way. I really don't. I think that the work that the legislator, legislature is doing and the work that the Republican Party is doing is lifting all people. We have a great economy. We've got sunshine year round. People are moving here and people are moving here in droves specifically because they want to be a Floridian. So if you, you know, you're hearing one person talk about discrimination. I've heard people firsthand feel discriminated against, and I'm, I'm guessing you both have to in our community. So when you hear whether or not that is a fact that you believe, that is a very real perception. How do you, how do you address that? I understand that, that sentiment, but we have to look at what the law says, right? The law does not discriminate against anybody. It doesn't specifically discriminate against any group or any individual because it would be illegal to do that, right? You know, our Constitution protects against that kind of thing. And so that's kind of a narrative I think that people have pushed forward. And yes, of course, when you're hearing this on television and people are telling you things that are, you know, that are not good, you're going to feel bad about it. But we have to be honest with each other about what this law does and about what these laws are aimed to do. And it's not to discriminate, it's to protect it's to protect the education. So when we see these communities vote overwhelmingly against the Republican Party, um, I think that shows the fact that they do feel discriminated against by these types of um, legislation. 
Um, we know that the uh, African American community is overwhelmingly Democrat when they show up to, to vote, as well as for the LGBTQ plus community when they show out to vote. Um, we've seen all of our communities, when they show out, the Democrats win. Um, and it's because of our legislation, it's because of our messaging. Um, we have to just energize our communities and make sure that we turn them out to vote on good messaging points. Um, and we're looking forward to that going into the next few elections. I just want to touch on that for a moment. You know, you're talking about turnout. Republican turnout was at 60% in Miami-Dade. Democrat turnout was at 40%. Yeah, turnout was and definitely turnout was, an issue with uh, Democrats. It was, but let's look at why that was, right? Do they like Republican policies that they weren't, you know, that wasn't bad enough for them to go out and vote? Is it because they don't like the top of the ticket, you know, with, with Charlie Crist and Val Demings, and particularly the Biden administration? I mean, you turn on your TV and you're not seeing American greatness. You're seeing failure after failure after failure. And so Democrats are not motivated. I, I just want to, I want to give you an opportunity to answer that, but you see that clock says zero on it, which means we are going to break and we will be right back with Jaden and Kevin. Stay tuned. We are back with Jaden D'Onofrio and Kevin Cooper, a Democrat, a Republican, most of all the youngest voters, because we so value hearing from especially such engaged young people. And, and I, wanted, I know you wanted to answer, we were talking a little bit about voter turnout in Miami-Dade and why Democrats did not. And, and it's really the young vote who are so big in numbers now, if only young people knew they'd get what they want if they all came and voted but they didn't. Why is that? Well, we're very excited going into the next few elections because what we saw in 2022 across the nation was that the, young, the youth vote really carried us across the line um, and proved that the, President Biden is very popular. You're talking nationally. Nationally, as of right now, is very popular amongst the younger generations. Here in Florida, what we saw was a lack of turnout. Um, but like I said, going into these next few elections, we're very excited. We feel like we've hammered our messaging points to the younger generations. We know why they have turned out to vote in all these other states. And we're very, very um, looking forward to um, the younger generations turning out in these next few elections. You know, this week we saw the governor launched his presidential campaign. We saw Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez talking about, you know, she, she potentially could be the next governor of Florida looking ahead, but I think she'll be the de facto governor in many ways because he'll be out campaigning. Um, the first four primary and caucus states, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, is where he's starting. Kevin, what do you think about the Florida governor kind of leaving us for the primary states this week? I don't think he's leaving us. I mean, you know, people can do two things at the same time. I think he's been a I'm great governor. I'm not sure governor. men are good at that, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> but go ahead. He's been a great governor, right? And uh, while he's a candidate for president, I'm sure he'll be doing a great job as our governor. We just had a legislative session that wrapped up. Uh, we're going to have another one in, in February as, as we move into next year in 2024. So I think he'll be a great governor. Uh, I don't have any personal concerns about that, though. No. The, um, that, that is, you've heard a big critique, Why, you know, a governor, and it's not the first governor to run for president, certainly not the first senator to run for president. So when there is a, from now until early 2024, campaign season is ramping up, the governor is using the first four states, sinking a lot of money, a lot of time, using that as a litmus test. This is going to be sort of the momentum, make it or break it. What do you expect for the governor in these states? Well, I think, um, as I mentioned before, I think it's quite um, it's quite saddening to see our governor run for president at the same exact time right now, where he pushed forward this bill SB seventy fifty that he pushed himself um, to get himself out of this governorship and state actually uh, through this tenure to run for president. Um, and now he's going to be heading into a very nasty primary with Donald Trump, who is now a former president who incited an insurrection uh, against. Um, uh, Governor DeSantis, who um, is wildly right wing. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting primary. Um, while the Republicans try and figure that out, I will say the Democratic Party is very united behind President Joe Biden, who put up a historic, historic um, results in the 2022 midterms. So, can yeah. we talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have not but leave one. me time for my other question because Absolutely. it's important. <laughs> we have not one, not three, but five highly qualified candidates for president. We're having a tremendously so spirited far. debate. Yeah, so far, and yeah. they may even grow to more. And the Democrats We're have having, one. Yeah, and, and 
We're giving the Republican voters the option to choose between candidates. We're having a, a debate about issues nationwide. I mean, state to state, coast to coast, we're talking about the issues, about the economy, about taxes, about the, all these other issues, education especially. And what do the Democrats offer the American people? You've got a, a dinosaur from a bygone era who's repeating kind of these, these failed policies. We've got a war in Ukraine. We've got an economy that's in free fall. And I, I just want to take what you're saying right now and key in on it, because those to a news person are talking points. Not at all, it's and, reality. <laughs> well, not that it's not reality, uh, that talking points can totally be reality, <laughs> but you both are so engaged in the process and I hear talking points. And I will tell you that people that are in their 20s and 30s and even 70s and 80s hear talking points and start to glaze over. And as we get on the campaign trail, if you follow a candidate around, you will hear the same speech over and over, the same stories that people laugh at because they haven't heard them yet and you've heard them 20 times. But I, I wonder if you would both weigh in on, when you meet and greet your contemporaries, the talking points allow you to get out information really quickly that you want. How, how do you get off the talking points and talk about reality? Talk about real. Well, the way I do it is I put, a, I put a, a, a chart, right? You've got the left and the right, and you've got what they're offering and what we're offering. And I, you see it every day. You see it every single day when you drive by the gas pumps and the prices are going higher and higher. You see it when you realize that but you're not getting... But then there's the high gas price, but a whole story and history of how they got there, which is much more nuanced than left-right. It is, but you also juxtapose that, right, with the fact that you've got a president who's not talking about these issues. Our president is not talking about these issues. And so you're frustrated, and people tell me this all the time. It's not just just a talking point that I read in a book or, or in a newspaper article or that I received in an email. This is legitimate stuff that you're driving by the gas pump and your, your ability to afford things is getting lower and lower. Your rent is going higher and higher. And how do you Food prices. That? I think that, as I mentioned before, the 2022 midterms proved a lot for uh, the overall standing of our political sphere here in, in the United States. Um, we have a, one party that has shown itself to be completely fine with an insurrection happening in our capital. Well, but, no. but before you go, before you go into the talking points on that side, a answer that to your contemporaries who say, my gas is too hot, my rent is too damn high. Well, how do you address that? <laughs> well, there's so many different uh, reasons for that, first off. I mean, we saw, you mentioned the war in Ukraine. That was a massive factor on our supply chain um, here in the United States. Um, we saw with our COVID, the COVID-19, uh, which was happening under President Trump, carried on by um, President Biden. There's realities here in this country that none of us can deny. There's no denying that some of our living um, situations across the country have been tough on our people. Um, but going back to what I was saying, as far as our voting, as far as the turnout, as far as the election results, it proved that President Biden's um, agenda is popular and that we care about engaging our voters all across the country in these problems. So let me take 30 seconds each. Kevin, 30 seconds, give me the issues as we ramp up to a national election. Give me the three issues that people like you are looking at. The economy, the economy, the economy. That's the, the three that everyone it. is talking about. It's the economy. Okay, and you didn't even use up your whole 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, Jaden, what do you think from For your perspective? For us, it, there's so many different facets to it because what we see here, especially in Florida, we see constant, constant divide on culture wars here in Florida. So is culture war, is that going to be a defining issue? You well, think? so it's funny that my, you know, Kevin here brings up um, the economy. We don't really see much messaging on the economy or much action on the economy here in Florida. We see a governor that continually engages on fighting our communities, especially our marginalized communities, rather than going, in out, going out and um, messaging on the economy. We care about the economy. We care about our communities. We care about engaging all of our voters across the state. That's our biggest priorities going into these next elections. And only if everybody was as engaged as you are. This is so much fun, and I hope you'll come back. And, and let us know, like, bring friends, because I think it's very important for everybody to hear all of these different voices, especially from the youngest voters. Kevin Cooper, Jaden D'Onofrio, love to have you aboard. And I Thank appreciate you your much. time. Thank you. All right, and uh, we will be right back. A reminder to tune in tonight for our Local 10 special, Staying Storm Safe, It Only Takes One. We look back at the devastation caused by Hurricane Ian and how we can prepare for the big storm. Be sure to watch our special tonight at 7 o'clock. And to re-watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, all you have to do is scan this QR code with your phone and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. 
and you are such a big part of this program. Please do connect with us on social media. We're so easy to find and follow. Reach out at Glenna WPLG on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you so much for being here with us this hour. Have a beautiful Memorial Day. And remember, stay in touch.